CL and Audrey under um, quite mysterious circumstances. <laughs> so back at the very beginning of last year, um, Lumio was in a relatively early stage um, and it had been used by you know activist groups and government departments and small community organizations. Um, a lot of the use was inside New Zealand and then one day uh, we saw some interesting groups sign up from Taiwan. Um, and I can't remember exactly how it happened, whether I sent an email or whether, I, I'm not sure how the first email exchange happened. Um, but we got into conversation about what was happening in Taiwan during the Sunflower Movement. And hearing about that mass mobilization and the way that it was being coordinated and the way that it was being supported by a community of technology-enabled um, you know, so, social enterprise savvy, just, it just felt like we connected with another community like Inspiro in another part of the world, engaged in the kind of horizontalist activism that we had been involved in at the very beginning of Limia. Um, so it was this really inspiring connection for us, and we, uh, we were on some, <laughs> some interesting video calls, I think while the occupation of the legislature was underway, and we did some late night development sprints to build some custom features. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's really nice to be here two years later. Um, I met CL in person in Washington DC at a very strange conference um, that we didn't really realize when we signed up was organized by Disney Corporation, <laughs> pretending to be this sort of youth activism forum. <laughs> Um, and we got to speak, they flew CL from Taiwan and to Washington DC, and they flew me from New Zealand to Washington DC, so that we could speak for three minutes each during the lunch break. <laughs> um, so this is a much, a much more pleasant setting. Um, so I, um, I mean, Rich talked a little about the Lumia team. So Hannah and James and Rich and about 10 other people back in, mostly back in New Zealand, some in the US. And each one of us comes from a, everyone in Lumio comes from a very different background. Like a very, very, uh, very diverse range of previous lives uh, before we gravitated to this idea. Um, so I'm going to just share a little bit about uh, my personal story and how I came to be working, uh, working in Lumio. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, sort of where, the way that Lumio is developed and where it's being used in the world and um, sort of where it's, where it's going next. Um, so a few years ago, I started a PhD. Um, I was going quite rapidly down this traditional academic track, and I was studying the evolution of collective intelligence. I started a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. And I was really interested in this question of why humans, as far as we know, like as far as Western science knows, humans are the only species that has this cumulative effect of technology, of socially exchanged information becoming more and more complex over time. So each generation is able to do things that the previous generation was unable to do. And as far as we know, no other species does this, even very closely related species. Um, so I was sent to Texas um, to work with chimpanzees at a primate sanctuary. Um, and I was teaching them to use touch screens um, to just sort of look at the to see if we could uncover something about you know, the root causes of why humans, but not chimpanzees, show this increasing uh, social evolution, cultural evolution over time. Um, it was very interesting work, um, very strange working with chimpanzees that really like throwing things at people and are really like, intensely strong, like chimpanzee muscle is eight times stronger than human muscle for the same volume. They're just they're really amazing, amazing creatures. And I got into this work from an animal rights background. So I think there's something really powerful when people think about humans as a species among other species. Um, really sort of practicing some humility and getting over this idea that we're at the center of the universe. Um, and in the course of that research, I found out that the primate sanctuary where I was working was actually a front for a massive breeding center where 
the American government is breeding thousands of our monkeys and squirrel monkeys and selling them into biomedical testing and pharmaceutical testing. Um, so this was a real turning point for me. Like I was just I was sort of heartbroken at the idea that my research was legitimizing this systematic suffering. Um, and so I made the decision, I mean, I was already feeling this, um, something that probably a lot of people in this room have experienced themselves, was feeling within academia that it's, you know, it's a really powerful institution for gathering knowledge, for learning. Uh, but so often, it feels so disconnected from anything meaningful in the real world and the time scale on which it operates. The production of knowledge translating into anything that impacts on meaningful problems is so painfully slow that that in combination with finding out about this breeding center, I just I threw the whole thing in. So halfway through the PhD, I just chucked it in. I went back to New Zealand and I got involved in grassroots organizing and community activism. So along with Hannah and Richard, we founded uh, an artists and musicians activist collective um, organizing around social justice issues and humanitarian causes, um, anti-surveillance activism, um, human rights activism. And then in 2011, something really interesting started happening. Um, these images of this wave of social movements, you know, just started sort of flooding through social media. Um, so, you know, from Tunisia through to Egypt, um, Tahrir Square uprisings, the Arab Spring, through to Latin America and Spain with the, the Indignados and 15M movements, and then finally Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park in New York. And then from there, Occupy movements springing up in more than 800 cities around the world. Um, and I just, I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a sort of, it just seemed like the characteristics that each of these movements shared. So, you know, they're all, they're all different, they're all adapted to local conditions, but the parallels between them were really striking. So they're all, you know, they were all explicitly non-violent movements. Um, they were all organized in a way that was directly democratic and participatory. Um, they were non-partisan, so they're not aligned with any particular political party. Um, so this is, this is Wellington, New Zealand. Um, and you can tell that it's New Zealand because everything is very small compared to the rest of the world. And because there's this horrible statue here of rugby players reaching for a rugby ball, which is like a, a symbol of national pride. Um, but there was an occupation there, like in 800 cities around the world. People who have never met each other before coming together and just sitting down in a circle and talking and organizing themselves in a way that is committed to hearing all of the voices in the discussion. Um, really hearing the intelligence of everyone in the community and feeding that into a deliberative process uh, where decisions are made that reflect the interests of everyone involved. Um, so there were three specific features of all of these movements that really, really struck me. And the first, like I don't, I don't know how these, um, these terms translate. These are not words that are commonly used in English. They're kind of academic jargon terms, um, but each of them represents a, quite a simple and important idea. Um, so intersectionality is just this basic idea that all oppression is connected, that all injustice is connected. Um, so during Occupy, the, the media narrative, the dominant media narrative was that, oh, these people, they don't really know what they're talking about because one minute they're talking about you know, women's rights and gender equity, and the next minute they're talking about the environment, and how can you care about human rights and the environment? You know, this idea that, um, this idea in the media that if you're, if you're concerned about more than one issue, that you don't know what you're talking about. And intersectionality just totally rejects that idea. It's a recognition that environmental destruction is intimately linked with capitalism and intimately linked with patriarchy and all other forms of oppression. Um, these movements were also about transformative change, rather than this traditional notion of revolutionary change, where you, you know, the idea is, well, there are bad people in power, so take the bad people out and put good people in and everything will be okay. So these movements rejected that idea. And instead, you know, people were really pushing for a whole systems change. This recognition that it's not just about bad people at the top, but it's about a system that's malfunctioning, or a system 
that has these institutionalized incentives that lead to decisions being made that are, that are in the interests of a small group at the expense of a large group, but that we really need this fundamental paradigmatic change. And these movements were also re recognizing the importance of prefigurative politics or prefigurative organizing. And that's just a, you know, a fancy word for this idea that it's really important that we organize ourselves in alignment with the change that we're trying to make in the world. So if we want a more sustainable, democratic, equitable world, we need to organize ourselves and our collectives and our networks and our organizations, our NGOs, in sustainable, democratic, equitable ways. Uh, so my, you know, my lived experience of that was totally transformative for me and for Richard and for Hannah and I think for you know, hundreds of thousands of people, actually millions of people if you sort of add them all up, people that participated in these movements all over the world. Um, so at the same time as seeing this amazing potential, we also saw the limitations of organizing in this way. So just the practical constraints of needing to be in the same place at the same time made it really difficult to scale the coordination of the movement. Um, Things like, you know, when you're sitting in a circle in person, the loudest voices can come to dominate the discussion and shut other people out. Uh, people that have more time on their hands can have more influence than other people just by virtue of being able to be there for, for longer, having more influence over the group. And we read this paper called The, the Tyranny of Structurelessness, um, which is by uh, an activist um, called Joe Freeman in the women's movement in the 1970s. And it's just a very beautiful articulation of what happens when power structures are not visible. So even in communities and movements that are committed to horizontality, if they don't have an analysis of power and a system of coordination that's about distributing power, then you get these emergent informal dictatorships and informal hierarchies. Uh, and so we're grappling with this challenge, this question, if the two dominant modes of decision making that are at work in society. So, you know, in activist groups and communities, bottom-up organizing. It can be really inclusive and empowering, but it can also be really difficult. It can be difficult to coordinate, it can be slow, and it can be fragile. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the institutions that we're organizing in resistance to, these top-down hierarchical structures, our political systems, our economic systems, where a tiny number of people at the top tell everyone else what to do, they can operate quickly in some cases, but it's at the expense of most people's perspectives. They operate quickly by excluding most people from participating. And so we're sitting, sitting in a circle, um, thinking through this question about how, how to come up with a third way. Like now, now that we have different technology, now that we have the internet, surely there must be a way of organizing in a networked fashion that you know, organizing in a way that's inclusive and empowering and fast and clear. So breaking that trade-off between effectiveness and participation. The trade-off between inclusion and getting things done. And at exactly that time, uh, Richard and I met with Joshua Bio, as Rich already mentioned. So this is some of the nice people at Inspiral, uh, these, those colorful little, little people that Richard showed. This is what they actually look like. Um, and we realized that we were working towards the same goal from different angles. So in Spiral, using the tools of social enterprise, the tools of business, we were using fairly traditional activist means. And we told them about this, you know, this question that we had and this idea that we had for a system of using the internet to build a simple tool for collaborative decision making. And we teamed up and started building it together. So after a few months of development, this project came to be known as Lumio. So Lumio is an open source tool for collaborative decision making. And at its core, it's very, very simple. It's just an online space for a group of people to talk through issues, to build agreement, and to come to clear outcomes. So it's about freeing people from the tyranny of decision making by email. And freeing people from the need to have in-person meetings every time they need to make some tiny operational decision. Um, so I'll just sort of show you a real-world example to, to make it real for you. 
Um, this, is a, this is a youth driven activist network in New Zealand called Generation Zero. And it's a, they're a nationwide network of several hundred members all around the country. And they've been using Lumia for the last two years to involve their, so to organize internally and to involve their community in the decisions they make as an organization. Um, so this is what a typical Lumia discussion looks like in their group. So this is a discussion about reducing transport emissions. So anyone in the group can start a discussion on any topic. And when the discussion gets to a point where someone in the group feels like it would make sense to make a decision, anyone can start a proposal. So a proposal is, a good proposal, is a very clear course of action that the group can take. So in this case, someone's proposing that the group should publish a smart transport plan for Auckland City. And when there's a proposal up, when there's a decision up, you can participate in it by clicking one of four buttons. So this is just taking the very basic protocols of consensus decision making, as has been practiced for generations, um, and putting it in an online format. So you can agree with the proposal, which means you support it, you want it to go ahead. You can abstain, which either means you don't have enough information or you don't really mind, you're happy for the group to decide. You can disagree, which means you don't think it's necessarily the best idea, but you're happy to go along with the group. You're not going to stand in the way of the group if everyone else thinks it's a good idea. Or you can block, which sometimes that's a register of a strong objection in some groups. Other groups use that as a veto. Depends on the, basically try to leave it as flexible as possible so groups can implement it in the way that works for them. And when you participate in the decision, you're prompted to give a, a really short like Twitter length summary uh, explaining why you've made the decision you've made. And people are able to change their position in response to concerns that are raised and in response to new information. So the discussion continues. Proposal always has a deadline, so you always come to a conclusion. And whether it's agreement or not, you come to a conclusion. Groups that use it really well will go through this flexible process where they'll develop proposals together where concerns are addressed along the way in the discussion and they build agreement and shared understanding and come to a solution that works for everyone. Um, and so, as soon as we got a, a prototype online, a very, very rough prototype that was literally a pie graph and four buttons, nothing else. There was no comment through, nothing else. Um, it started getting picked up in some really interesting places. Um, so, you know, we got this tool for activists and we're very surprised when it started being used by the city government in Wellington, um, who one year previously had been sending us eviction notices to clear us from the public lawn that we were camping on during Occupy. And they used Lumio for um, involving citizens around Wellington in um, collaborative strategy formation. Um, it was about a, a strategy for managing alcohol in the city. Um, and then it started getting picked up internationally. So conference organizers in India started using it, through to grocery cooperatives in San Francisco, um, through to high schools, um, networks of preschools, families using it to make decisions about where to go on vacation, like really, really diverse use cases. Um, and now we've gotten to the point where more than 20,000 groups have made more than 35,000 decisions, um, and it's really just growing from here. Um, so the first large-scale use case outside of New Zealand was in the Hungarian student movement. Um, so Hungarian student activists took the code and translated it into Hungarian, um, and they organized large-scale protests in response to government education cuts. Um, really effective mobilization, and they got the government to back down on their proposed cuts. They occupied universities, they occupied government buildings, and they really forced the government to listen. Uh, this is. This is Puerto del Sol in Madrid. Um, this was earlier this year. So some of the people that were in Korea with CL and Richard and Anna and I um, are from Madrid. They were involved in the 15M movement. They were involved in Podemos. They introduced Lumio to the Podemos movement. And a few months later, we had 20,000 users in Spain. Um, they've used it in small scale working groups in different communities all over Spain. Um, in New Zealand, the government, earlier this year, the government statistics department used Lumio to involve citizens in uh, collaborative discussion about uh, the way the census, the questions for the 2018 census have developed. 
Um, and as a result of that consultation process, online and offline, and discussion particularly with, uh, with people in the LGBT community in New Zealand, um, the New Zealand government has now decided to, to set a government standard for the collection of non-binary gender identity data, uh, which they're claiming is a world first. Um, so really interesting to see actual listening. Um, I had to put this slide in, of course. <laughs> Otherwise, CL would be very angry. Um, now, so I, I only know um, I only know the way that um, the way that Audrey and CL and others in the Gov Zero community have been experimenting with Lumio, largely from Audrey's blog posts and learning that the the sign language or the, the signing working group. Um, use Lumio to discuss and maybe make decisions about the hand signals that were used in the decision making process. Um, that made us very, very happy. <laughs> uh, this is the team, uh, the Lumio team, or most of the Lumio team. So you can recognize Hannah and <laughs> every, <laughs> all the, the people back home. So we're organized as a worker on cooperative. We're also a social enterprise. So this means we have a social mission in our constitution and as a cooperative, the organization is collectively owned by all the people working in it. So we're democratically run and collectively owned. Um, yeah, I was just gonna, I'm, I'm out of time. I see a flashing zero, <laughs> but just very, very quickly. Um, we're, what we've seen through Lumio is, um, it's, it's kind of, it's really easy to get a very positive impression of what's happening in the world. Um, so we're contacted by, you know, these amazing grassroots activist groups that want to use this technology to increase their effectiveness in the world, you know, to organize themselves democratically and effectively to make real change. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we're contacted by these people working in government that want government to become more participatory and more inclusive. And these people are all pushing in the same direction from inside and outside government. You know, they're really all pushing towards this situation where our institutions are actually controlled by the people that they supposedly represent um, where you know, people who are affected by the decisions that these institutions are making are involved in making those decisions. Um, so I, it's sort of this feeling that the, the structures themselves are very resistant to change uh, in New Zealand, and I, I get the sense that that's true here as well, and in pretty much every country. But the people within those structures seem really, uh, seem really ready for change. Not everywhere, but in many places. Um, so just. I don't know, it just feels like this time where the world is waking up to the idea that our institutions are made of people and that people want change. Um, so thank you very much for having us here. Thank you.